Hi, welcome to Mental Health Matters. I'm Shannon Elliott. Today we're in San Francisco at the Work and Wellbeing 2013 conference sponsored by the American Psychological Association Center for Organizational Excellence. Join me as I speak to some speakers throughout the country on mental health, wellness, and the workplace. David, thanks so much for joining me today. Sure, happy to be here. I understand you have a position with the American Psychological Association. What do you do for them? Uh, I am the Assistant Executive Director for Organizational Excellence at APA. And so what I do is I head up our Center for Organizational Excellence, which is really about applying psychology to a variety of workplace issues to promote employee well-being and organizational performance. And part of that includes our Psychologically Healthy Workplace program. So tell me about this conference. We're in San Francisco. Folks are coming from around the country. What's the goal of the conference and who all is here? Well, I'm excited. It's our first conference on the West Coast. We've been doing this in Chicago for a number of years and in Washington, D.C. for a couple of years. Uh, and it, it was time to travel west. So I'm glad to be here. Um, the, this Work and Wellbeing Conference is an opportunity for us to bring together people from varying backgrounds. So it's a lot of psychologists. Uh, including industrial organizational, consulting, clinical and counseling, occupational health, but it, but it also mixes that with people from different backgrounds, human resource management, management, nursing, uh, and, and part of the value that we really get from this conference uh, is making it interdisciplinary because when you're talking about promoting well-being, when you're talking about organizational performance, uh, it, it's a very complex issue and we do a better job when all of these players are at the table. And so we have the academic side represented, but we also have practitioners both within organizations but also consultants who work with organizations. And the goal is really to take good evidence-based research but then apply that so that people walk away with concrete, actionable things they can do to make for a better work environment. Seems like a very logical approach. Is this sort of a new wave of thinking in this industry and within workplaces, or has this been around for a while? Well, it's evolved over time. Uh, when, when we really started this program back in 1999, there were some cutting edge employers who were already thinking about wellness and health promotion in the workplace. And so they had some of the traditional wellness programs. And these were employers who, they really got it. They understood that the, the well-being of their workforce was linked to the performance and success of the company. And so they were taking steps because they, they believed it. They, they knew it would make a difference. Over time, what we've seen is other organizations come to understand that as well. They understand that health and functioning and performance are, are all linked together. And so now, even those organizations who aren't doing it because, well, it's the right thing to do, it certainly is the right thing to do, but now even those who are just interested in the bottom line know if they don't create a healthy work environment that's good for the employees as well, that long term, their gains aren't sustainable. So building on that, what is a psychologically healthy workplace? What does that look like on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, it's a psychologically healthy workplace is an organization that puts a variety of programs and policies in place that, that serve two goals. They enhance the health and well-being of the employees, but they also promote performance and success within the, org within the organization. And there's no one-size-fits-all approach. There are a lot of different ways to do this, and a lot of the success of what they're doing depends on how well they customize their policies, their practices, to meet the actual needs of their workforce and the company. Um, that said, we find that the kinds of things that they're doing uh, tend to fall into five categories. So they're involving employees in meaningful ways. So they're giving them more autonomy, more control over things that affect them on a day-to-day -day basis. Feedback. Right, absolutely. They, they've got uh, the typical health and wellness programs, including a, an important mental health component. So they have behavioral health benefits, they have EAP, so they have employee assistance uh, programs available. Um, they're growing and developing their workforce, so they're giving people an opportunity to learn new skills and to apply those on the job. They're doing a good job rewarding and reinforcing what's going on, so employee recognition. And that's, that's not just the monetary and formal awards. Uh, it's also teaching managers how to express appreciation, how to thank people for a job well done so that they feel like what, they're do, what they do goes noticed in the organization. Seemingly so simple, but not always practical. Yeah, right? it, yeah. It, and many of these things we find that it doesn't take a lot of money. They're, they don't have to be expensive. Some of the small informal things can be the most effective on the recognition side, what we're seeing is a lot of organizations are implementing peer recognition programs. So yes, acknowledgement from a supervisor or leader in the organization is great, but sometimes more meaningful is acknowledgement by a coworker colleague who you work with every day who says, 
what you do matters and, and really makes a different and difference and I appreciate your contributions. And the last area is uh, work-life balance, which is about flexible work arrangements, providing resources to help people meet their work and non-work demands so that when they are on the job, they can be at their best. And tying this all together is effective communication practices and that, that spans into all of those practice areas. And collectively, when all this is put in place, it serves to promote that well-being and performance in an organization. So you mentioned earlier that the APA has a psychologically healthy workplace program and corresponding <laughs> awards. What are those about? Yeah, back in 1999, uh, it actually started in New Jersey. One of our affiliated state psychological associations launched a state-level award to recognize companies who were taking steps to create a healthy work environment. And APA saw what they were doing and thought this is a great way to reach people where they spend a bulk of their waking hours. Uh, that's where adults are all the time and what better place to reach them during the day in the workplace. So we built a model and, and helped spread that to other states, provinces, and territories. And so between 1999 and now, it's grown from that one program in New Jersey, and now there are 56 states, provinces, and territories with local programs. All of that feeds up into APA's program, which spans North America. So we've got Canadian provinces and US states. And we take the awards that they give at the local level, and we take a deeper dive. We dig into the data, we do more analysis of it, and it becomes a very competitive process. And we recognize the best of the best. So these are companies that are taking steps in those five areas I talked about, and they're showing results in terms of well-being and performance. And so we recognize the best of the best, and we have uh, an awards program where we present those awards in Washington, D.C. each year at, at a large award ceremony. And it's always a lot of fun, and it's great to also highlight these success stories. So what are some of those success stories? So what kind of innovative programs are these awardees implementing and how effective have they been? Well, it, it spans almost anything you can imagine from uh, organizations who've realized that uh, their, their community was struggling at the time and basic needs of their workforce who lived in that community weren't being net, met. So these employers started uh, cooking home-cooked meals and providing them to employees at, at lunchtime, inviting in members of the community who were there in their stores and facilities to come share that with them. And uh, so they started out meeting those most basic needs and then from there going to help employees meet their financial needs and other needs for growth and development and so on. So sometimes it's really basic in terms of where it starts. Others have done a phenomenal job with uh, employee surveys and feedback. Every organization does employee surveys. Most of them do them terribly. Um, they don't use the, the data that they collect. It never gets fed back to employees, so they never know how it's used, and in many cases it's not even used. So it's been organizations that have found great ways to really increase the number of employees who are giving meaningful input taking that input and doing something with it, making a good work environment that responds to the needs and concerns of the workforce. Uh, another great example is an organization that provided social services that needed to build a new facility and they had had an old, pretty run-down facility that was in need of refurbishment and they decided to build a new one. And rather than just slapping one together and moving everybody over, they involved employees at every step along the way from meeting with the architects and designers about what they needed to be able to do their jobs well, what the clients they served needed there, who many who had very disabilities, physical and mental health issues. And so they helped design the actual facilities and building and they'd go out and tour while they were actually doing the build and they would make adjustments along the way um, to the point where they were about ready to launch this new facility and they went and did the tour and they found issues that were, were problems that they identified. The organization actually delayed the opening of the new facility while they fixed that. So it cost them revenue, but the end result was a, a new work environment that very much met the needs of the workforce and the clients who they were serving. And employee satisfaction and engagement went up, client satisfaction, they were filling all of the spots there like they had never had before. Um, and so it was a win-win for everybody. What are the costs of job stress? Well, it, it depends on who you ask. Uh, the, the large numbers, the American Institute of Stress estimates that job stress costs U.S. industry $300 billion a year. And that's absenteeism, it's turnover, it's lost productivity, it's medical, legal, and insurance fees. So there's a lot wrapped up into that number. And th these are all based on models and projections, so you can debate the accuracy, but what you can't debate is that it has a large impact. These are big dollars attached to it that not only is it affecting people's health, but it, it also affects the bottom line for organizations. So this is a business issue too, as well as a human one. How does an organization benefit from investing in the wellness of its employees? 
Well, in, in addition to improving the health status of employees, so reducing their health risks and improving their overall well-being, on the business side of things, it can reduce absenteeism, it can reduce turnover, it can improve productivity and job performance, you see fewer accidents and injuries on the job, customer service and satisfaction goes up. So you see a lot of different outcomes on the business side of the equation that get better when your workforce has higher levels of well-being. So all these thing, things sound wonderful and hypothetically easy, but maybe for some companies that are just starting out, it might not be so easy, they might see some challenges. What are some common obstacles and challenges to implementing employee wellness programs? Yeah, human behavior is really complex, yeah. and you know, as psychologists, that's what we study all the time, and we know that it's not often as easy as it sounds sometimes. And uh, in, in the United States, employers and, and other groups in the community have been trying to improve the health status of Americans for decades. And uh, not only has there been relatively little progress, in some cases it's actually gotten a lot worse with obesity rates and so on. Um, but it, it, you don't have to start big and complicated. So if an employer wants to actually start with uh, creating a healthy work environment and putting some of these things in place, they can start small. And the, the best place to start is to ask your employees. So employee surveys, but also having uh, suggestion mechanisms, whether it's a suggestion box or breakfast with the CEO or many different channels that you can get input from employees because the biggest obstacle is just not actually seeking that input. Employers assume they know what their workforce needs and so they may slap programs in place. They put a wellness program in place because that's what everybody else is doing and we think that will be best so here it is, use it. Um, that may not fit the needs of your workforce. So the, the, the big barrier there is just not knowing the actual needs of your workforce and it, it can be simple. Ask them and, and that's a good starting point. Um, other barriers that get in the way, lack of upper level leadership support for these things. That sometimes even in organizations where the top level leaders give it good lip service and they say we're providing all this, we really want to create a healthy work environment and we want you to use these programs, they themselves aren't using them. You won't see them set foot in the gym. They won't use the wellness programs. They won't tap into mental health benefits or EAP services even when they need them. Not leading by example. No, and, and it provides uh, a, a, it provides a really negative example because what they're doing, they're, they're not walking the talk. And in organizations that really get it and do it effectively, they do lead by example. And the, the CEOs are great champions of these programs because they themselves are benefiting from them. What can companies do to support employees with mental health or behavioral health challenges? Well, providing a good mental health benefit is a start. So as part of your health care coverage, having good behavioral health coverage, that, that's key. Um, having good information and communicating that so that employees know how to tap into and access those resources. There are a lot of great resources out there, um, including EAP services. So most organizations now have an employee assistance program. Most employees in the organizations don't know it exists, or even if they do, they don't know how to access it or what they might use it for. So exactly. they're, they're great resources that are there that people don't know how to use or when it might actually benefit them. Um, stigma is also unfortunately still an issue in the workplace. People are concerned with privacy and confidentiality and they're worried that if their employer uh, knows that they're struggling with a mental health issue that it might negatively affect their career. Um, and it's unfortunate. We, we've seen stigma get better over the years, but it is still a reality. And I, I think it goes back to communication, putting information out there, normalizing the fact that a large number of Americans struggle with these issues and that it's just like any other illness or problem that there are treatments available, there are things that work, and there are resources they can tap into that will make a difference. And knowing that that if employees are using that and communicating it, that it's not only helping them deal with those issues, but it helps them be better at work too. Well, David, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to talk to me today. It's been a pleasure and I've learned so much in the short time I've talked to you. So thank you. Sure, thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it. Welcome, Mark. Thanks for joining me and taking a couple minutes out of your busy mm -hmm. schedule today. So I understand you are the president of Adridge Consulting. Can you tell me a little bit about what you do in your role there? Well, sure. Thanks for, for being here as well. Uh, I provide a, a solo practice working with organizations and healthcare providers and some nonprofits, groups that are interested in promoting workplace mental health in different ways, and uh, kind of do a lot of what they call applied research. So I will look at things in the literature and tell people here are best practices or what's going on in science. And then I also work primarily with businesses and other people that are doing service delivery to try to 
make sure they understand what's going on and best practices and how to deliver that. And then a third phase is sort of doing evaluation and statistics and research projects around you know, what they're actually doing and is it working right and are there ways to improve it. So. So your presentation had a lot of numbers and a lot of data, which is fascinating. But one thing I want to ask you is what percentage of employees in the workplace actually suffer from a mental health condition? Most of the data in the U.S. and Canada says it's about one in three okay. will have it in their lifetime and about one in four um, every year. And so it's a very high rate. It's one of the most highest prevalent conditions there are um, compared to a lot of other medical and health conditions that get more coverage. And of those, how many actually seek out treatment? Oh, about one in ten employees a year probably sees some sort of mental health provider in benefits like outpatient mental health care or uh, maybe addictions or so is much lower, about one percent. About uh, five percent of most employees in a year will use a workplace-based counseling service. Employee assistance programs are popular in most big organizations and they're free for people to use. So they're a nice resource that doesn't cost anything and uh, you can use them anonymously and so forth. So. The workplace EAP is a good good resource that most people start with and then they get referred to other more specialized services. So what do EAPs look like? Do they vary from company to company? Um, what do they do? Well, good question. They have a long history, but uh, the modern EAPs are a mix of, uh, if you're a big company, typically you'll have one or two staff that are full-time working within a company. It's called the internal model. And they know the company culture and they know all the benefits and know all the partner programs, but usually they're trained in social work or psychology and maybe have organizational development focus. And they help with management and training and getting mental health issues just on the radar screen. And then they refer people to a lot of services or maybe they handle crisis. Uh, other models that are popular is they, they want the benefit, but they have it outsourced to a private firm, so it's um, kind of hands-off from the company's perspective, often for confidentiality issues, and people just don't want to have their employer know about things, and so they feel more comfortable going off-site to a provider, but the company still pays for it. So it's kind of an internal or an external model. That's a really fantastic resource for folks. So how effective are EAPs not only for the employee who's seeking mm -hmm. help, but what benefits are there to the employer as well? Oh, good question. Obviously, if you're distressed or you have a work issue or you have a family issue or a marital issue, those are some of the most common reasons people use an EAP or a counselor. The counseling itself usually is highly effective. Most people only need two or three sessions. And it's an acute issue, but usually it's not severe enough that they need to miss work or you know, go on disability or something like that. It's more of an acute kind of uh, distressing issue that they find resources for. And then uh, the bigger picture is often about three-fourths of those people have a work performance issue or maybe mm -hmm. half have an absence issue. And those kind of being at work and being more productive or missing work less often happen routinely through mental health counseling. It's one of the most common outcomes from it for the company is what they call human capital improvement. So the savings in work performance and absence days. And there's smaller uh, savings down the road in health care and avoiding disability and kind of bigger ticket items. But those really apply to the more severe cases, uh, which are much less common in, in companies because most people are doing good enough to be at work. Mm -hmm. So it's more the productivity and workplace savings that's a big deal. Well, thank you so much for joining me today, Mark. It's been an absolute pleasure and best of luck to you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Eric, for joining me today. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. So I understand you have a position with the Society for Human Resource Management. Can you tell me a little bit about what you do there? Sure. Um, I am their manager of diversity and inclusion, and we have a team of two. Uh, so my boss is the vice president of DNI, uh, and the two of us just basically are, are the simplified version of our job is that we create content, both for diversity and inclusion professionals and also for HR generalists who need to know what they need to know about diversity to do their jobs a little bit better. So why is diversity so important to a psychologically healthy workplace? Well, you know, psychologically healthy workplace is an interesting term because psychological health, to me at least, doesn't just mean you're free of psychological disease. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> There's a difference between being neutral and really being healthy, which psychologically healthy people are engaged and they're happy and they're, you know, they're really productive and they, they you know, feel good uh, about what's going on. And, and you know, obviously, um, for segments of the population who are what we might call a non-traditional employee, people of color, uh, women in certain industries, um, people who are LGBT, people who are you know belong to faith traditions that are that are uh, minority, they might feel targeted in an organization that is not explicitly inclusive of them. And so there's something about their identity or their person that they feel like they need to keep under wraps or they need to um, bury somehow at work, and it causes a lot of stress. 
But actually, I think D&I really helps everybody because even if you are a white, straight, male, Christian, middle class, everything kind of normal, all-American, apple pie kind of employee, if you work for an organization that's explicitly inclusive of everybody, you start to think, okay, so if I have some wacky off-the-wall idea that I might want to bring up at the next meeting, I think I can do that because pretty much everyone around here, it's okay to be who they are. So maybe the weirdness that I'm you know, keeping buried in terms of like crazy innovative ideas I might have, I can give voice to some of those. And that's just going to help organizations do better. Uh, this day and age, you know, the most innovative organizations tend to win. Are there any studies or evidence or anecdotes to support that? Oh, lots, yeah. I mean, there's, there's quite a bit of uh, just business case um, literature that's out there where they've isolated uh, every other kind of variable you can imagine and said, you know, it is true that organizations that are more diverse and more inclusive, so you can be a diverse organization and not be very inclusive, in which case you're probably going to be, you're going to underperform. Um, but organizations that are more diverse and are more inclusive make more money. Um, so I think there's a humanistic reason for doing all of this stuff, which is clearly what brought me to this work. But when you get into a lot of the data that's out there, there's a real business case for doing this as well. And there's, there's you know, a good reason why an organization that wants to be more successful will want to invest some of their resources in creating a more diverse and inclusive organization. If one belongs to a minority group, or what you said is, is a non-traditional employee, what might a psychologically unhealthy workplace look like? What might be a case study? Well, I think anything that either targets you, makes you feel unsafe somehow, you know, it'll add an incredible amount of stress uh, to your workplace. So for instance, you know, a gay soldier in the days pre Don't Ask, Don't Tell could literally be fired should anyone understand, you know, what their, their sexual orientation really is, which is not something that's mutable or changeable. They just have to live with that level of fear. In that particular job, there's high levels of fear anyway. There's a, there's a you know, people die uh, on that particular job. And so to add yet another level of stress uh, to that, I think, is, is, an, is a, you know, a stark example of something being really psychologically unhealthy. I think in other organizations, it's just that idea of being rendered invisible. Mm -hmm. That, you know, we hear about these microaggressions all the time where, where a, you know, a woman will have a great idea at a meeting and everyone goes, oh, okay, and then five minutes later, the guy next to her has the exact same idea, and everyone says, oh, that's brilliant, that's amazing, and she's left thinking, do you even see me? You know, and, and we've learned a lot about uh, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and one of the things that, that we know now, years later after this research, and it's great research, but he got the order a little wrong, because actually the base level of needs that, that human beings tend to really have is this idea of belonging. Uh, and that's why people are drawn to working in organizations. But if you have this need to really belong, part of that is a need to be seen by people. And if, if something like that happens to you and it repeats itself over and over, you start to think, I'm, t I'm here but no one can see me. I'm talking but no one can hear me. Um, and it starts to kind of, there's this level of toxicity uh, that, that that experience tend to take on after a while. Your self -esteem, I would exactly, yeah, yeah. yeah. In your session, you mentioned you sometimes do diversity trainings for corporations, organizations, mm -hmm. et cetera. And you said sometimes you come across managers who want to be the ultimate inclusive manager, inclusive workplace, and they say they have a goal of being colorblind. Yeah. Why is that actually a terrible idea? Well, it's, first of all, it's a terrible idea because it's not possible. Um, we tend to uh, notice those kinds of visible differences within split seconds of meeting somebody. Uh, and so if your goal is to be absolutely quote-unquote colorblind, I think what they're trying to say is I want to treat people the same way I would treat you whether or not you're white or black. Um, and so I want to have the same levels of respect uh, and, and hold you with the same amount of dignity as I was holding anybody else, which is a fantastic goal. And that's a great way to say that. The idea that you would be colorblind is, is problematic because A, it's not possible. B, when you try to submerge all that stuff, you basically shove it into your unconscious where it has a greater ability to work you. And so any biases that you might have learned early on in your life about people of color, for instance, um, they'll tend to work on you uh, without you realizing it. And so you become more susceptible to those kind of biases rather than less. So higher levels of self-awareness uh, just tend to help. And then thirdly, it adds to that invisibility piece. It's like if I'm pretending to be colorblind, then I am not going to take your experience as a, per, as a person of color into account when I'm working with you and dealing with you, and it's just another part of you that I'm refusing to see. 
uh, which really makes the person that I'm speaking to, especially if I'm somebody who has some level of authority over you, uh, it makes it less okay for that person to bring up that experience and really make their whole person, their whole self, available to me on the job. Uh, so it's problematic for a number of reasons and completely well-intentioned. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a struggle because I don't want to just, you know, smack that person down by saying, no, you shouldn't have that goal and that's the wrong goal to have. I have to very gently kind of reorient them to, I think what you mean to say is you want to hold people in equal amounts of respect and that's, that's great. So what would you recommend as an alternative? What, how do you work with managers on that? Um, basically just that. It's to figure out how to re-language it. But, you know, language is a key to understanding, right? So it's like tra just train them to use different kinds of language. And usually, um, if I have the opportunity to do it, the best thing to do in a class situation like that is to, to ask the people of color in the room how they feel about that goal. And usually I can depend on them to say, I don't want you to be colorblind. Um, I want you to see me for who I am, which is a black woman or a Chinese man. Um, but I want you to not let that affect the level of respect you have for me or the level of, but I want you to be aware that those differences exist and, and there's a difference there. And typically, then I don't have to be the bad guy. They can hear it from their peers, which is more helpful anyway. Uh, and it's coming from a person, you know, because I don't know that I, as a white person, have the authority to say that. I think if I were, you know, different visibly, I might be able to say something different in front of a class. But there are some pros and cons of being a white male diversity trainer sometimes. And that's usually a, a situation where I, I'd let the class do that work for me. Well, thank you, Eric, for taking time out of your busy schedule oh, and educating me and letting me pick your brain. Best of luck to you. Okay, thanks thank so you. much. To learn more about the APA's Psychologically Healthy Workplace Program and Activities, visit the APA Center for Organizational Excellence website at www.apaexcellence.org. To read Eric Peterson's article, Invisibility and the Toxic Work Environment, visit apaexcellence.org. To view articles and research on wellness and productivity in the workplace, visit the Institute for Health and Productivity Management website at www.ihpm.org. In San Francisco with Mental Health Matters, I'm Shannon Elliott. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time.